Hello, everybody. How's it going? Good. Thank you. Thanks to everybody who is uh, tuning in to this uh, virtual classroom uh, today. And all week, actually, OSEARCH uh, and some of our collaborating scientists, like Dr. Kim Ritchie, who's here, uh, we've been talking about shark bacteria and how it could actually end up benefiting us as humans. Uh, today, our class uh, is going to be taught by Education Ambassador uh, Jennifer Cotton. Um, and this is a class for grades 7 through 12. Earlier this week, we did a class for grades, for younger grades. Um, so we also did a live stream yesterday talking about shark bacteria. Um, so if you caught any of those, uh, hopefully there's not too much overlap, but maybe this will just be a refresher for some of you. But we did want to just take a moment to say, Welcome. Um, today's uh, virtual classroom is presented by our partner, BACD. Uh, we do know that many of you are looking for hand sanitizer solutions right now. BACD has been a partner uh, for over a year now. Um, and we do want to let you know that you can, that supplies of BACD are back in stock. Uh, there is a link in this uh, video window on our website where you can uh, Purchase BACD, use promo code uh, OSEARCH at checkout to save uh, and get free um, shipping. Uh, and with that, let me introduce Jen and Dr. Kim Ritchie. Uh, Jen for Cotton is an education ambassador uh, for OSEARCH. She's been a huge part of making sure that we can put together classes like these and so that we have... Um, so that we have our free education STEM curriculums for everybody to download. Dr. Kim Ritchie has been working with OSEARCH uh, since about 2015. Is that right, Kim? Yep. Great. Uh, her specialty is bacteria, so she's here to lend us her expertise. She's the one who's actually on the deck, swabbing the sharks, collecting the samples so that we can take them back to the lab. So welcome, Kim and Jen. Thank you both very much for being here. Just so everybody knows, we do have a comment section right below. Uh, let's see some of you are using. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask them. I may save them to the end. If it's really good, I might interrupt whoever's presenting to ask it then. I'll also be monitoring some of the comments. Um, I am John Osearch, comms manager. If you see that name pop up in the, um, in the comments, that's me trying to answer some questions so that I don't have to interrupt them, but please ask away. So with that, I will turn it over to Jen to get things started. All right, hi everybody. So today we're gonna to be going over some of our bacteria studies, um, looking at how bacteria reproduces and how antibiotic resistance can occur. And then Dr. Richie's gonna go in and tell you all about her really cool work. It's one of my favorite um, projects that goes on on the ship just because it's so awesome. <laughs> and it's not something that um, you really think about when you when you look at shark research. So, and it's a really great avenue um, outside of strictly marine biology uh, studies. So um, microbiology is on the up and up and uh, biotech is also a really great uh, new career path that a lot of kids started to get into. So her work is really cool if you're into that kind of stuff. So I'm really excited for today. Um, we're gonna start by just kind of explaining how long bacteria has been around, what does it mean to be a pathogen, um, and then the reproduction process and into some antibiotic resistance. So uh, we're gonna start with the evolution of bacteria. So humans, we've been around about 200,000 years, like our, the more modern humans that we think of in history books. Um, so, uh, sharks have been around about 400 million years, so a lot longer than we have. Sharks are actually older than trees, so they've been around a very long time. But bacteria has been the one that really start rocking on Earth before any other organisms. They've been around uh, about 3.5 billion years ago when cyanobacteria first showed up on Earth. So cyanobacteria, is one that gives us so much oxygen. Um, it actually produces every third breath you take come from cyanobacteria, so it's a powerhouse oxygen producer, and it's found all in the ocean. Um, so if you really think about it, bacteria has been around 3.5 billion years, Earth about 4.6 billion years old, so it's been around from almost the very beginning of time. Um, so do all animals have bacteria? Yes, so we're gonna go into a lot of these relationships uh, that they have. So next slide, please. All right, so 
you might hear the term pathogen quite a bit, um, especially in the news right now when talking about, you know, COVID-19 and, you know, how it's making so many people sick. But what does that actually mean to be a pathogen? So a pathogenic organism is any organism that causes disease to its host. So it's a wide range of things. Um, so a pathogen is a really scary word, um, but it's very broad. So there's four different types of pathogenic organisms. We have viruses, which is what we're all kind of quarantined and why we're watching this right now because of is a, is a virus. There's bacteria, um, there's fungi, and then there's also just parasites. Um, However, only a handful of bacteria is actually considered like bad bacteria. Um, a lot of bacteria is good and it's beneficial and we actually need it for daily processes. So um, like your gut has bacteria in it that allows for you to digest. So you need these bacteria. So about 85% good, whereas there's 15% that are gonna be considered bad or pathogenic. Um, pathogenic bacteria that you might be familiar with are things like Salmonella, Listeria, E. coli. These are all the types of bacteria that cause all these food recalls. You know, when you saw earlier this year how the romaine lettuce kept getting recalled, and that was because it had um, a bacteria on it. Um, so a lot of food recalls are because of those. Um, so these can cause food poisoning, which doesn't make us feel good. If you ever had food poisoning before, you're very familiar with this type of pathogenic bacteria. And it can also be things like strep, um, strep, your strep throat when you get sick and also staph. So a staph infection like MRSA um, can cause a lot of issues with your skin and make you really sick. Um, and MRSA is actually an antibiotic resistant version of staph. So we'll get into what that means here in a little bit. So next slide. All right, so we're gonna look at how bacteria actually reproduces because it's very interesting and it's a lot different than our, how our cells uh, divide and it can happen very quickly and at a quick rate which is why it's so important when you do get a, uh, a sign an antibiotic that you take the whole thing because of the way that these reproduce and you guys are going to look at an activity at the end where you can demonstrate this whole process um, so we're going to look at the steps of binary fission which is how bacteria reproduces so it starts with the parent cell, um, so that parent bacteria, oh, sorry, and through this process, it seems it's just going to start replicating and eventually it's going to split into two different daughter cells. So something that's important to note with these is that these daughter cells are genetically identical to the parent. Um, so when you have um, a bacteria that is resistant to antibiotics and that starts dividing, you end up with this strand that is now, it's passed on those traits to all of those daughter cells and they are now antibiotic resistant as well. So there doesn't allow for a lot of variation in genes this way. So when we have a bacteria that can be killed by a certain um, antibiotic, you can knock them all out with one go and you don't have this diversity where you're trying to figure out and switch out medicines all the time. However, on the flip side of that, if you have um, some of these bacteria that are antibiotic resistant, it won't take to that medicine either. So it's a little bit of a tricky situation. This is very important for you to follow your doctor's orders with this. Um, next slide. All right, so I'm going to talk about how antibiotic resistance occurs, and then Dr. Ritchie is going to explain a lot of her work and how bacteria actually do produce these antibiotics. Um, so you have a high number. We're going to go from left to right on the screen. So a high number of bacteria, a few of them are resistant to antibiotics, and you have this in your sample. You add an antibiotic to the sample, and you can kill most of the bacteria, um, as well as that good bacteria is actually helping to protect your body. The third step is the resistant bacteria are now um, in these preferred conditions to start kind of grow and get out of control and take over. And then they can even then start um, transferring this resistance over and it can cause a whole lot of other issues. So with that, Dr. Ritchie is gonna go ahead and talk to you about her work that she's doing um, and where she's swabbing from our sharks to get some of this bacteria to produce these antibiotics. I'm gonna look at this clip first, I think. Yeah, stand by, trying to get it to play. Hang on. Kim, do you wanna mute your mic real quick? So what we're gonna see actually that Dr. Richie introduced some of her work in a quick video that I'm trying to get Word to work. 
Sharks and rays have this amazing ability to, to heal their wounds very quickly. My part is to see if there's a beneficial microbial component. And from what we've seen in stingray research, there is there a high percentage of bacteria that may act as an immune system, that first line of defense for sharks and rays that produce antibiotics. We're running out of antibiotics that work worldwide, and this is a novel source of new antibiotics and another avenue of interest for some Okay, so you kind of saw, kind of saw some action there on the boat. So uh, just to just to kind of go back over what I'm interested in, I'm really interested in symbiosis, actually. So that might be beneficial or mutualistic with the, their marine hosts. Um, and so I, this top left up here is kind of talking about my beneficial shark micro project. So I'm looking at bacteria on the surface and I'm asking if they're beneficial, if they might play a, a role in wound healing by looking to see if they produce antibiotics. I know this is true in other organisms. They have other marine organisms have bacteria that produce antibiotics and they kind of act as a first line of defense to help protect the animal. And since um, sharks are so ancient and bacteria are even more ancient, it made, makes sense to me that they could have co-evolved this really nice uh, beneficial relationship. So that's my main interest. But um, as, uh, as was just mentioned, um, we don't, also don't have antibiotics that work against a lot of antibiotic resistant pathogens that humans have. So it's also um, another avenue of research is to look at some of these antibiotics that they're producing to see if they might be used in human therapies as antibiotics for humans. So up here at the top left, you're kind of looking at if you look at these little dots up here um, in this panel right above the shark, those are, those are bacterial colonies and those colonies come from the shark. So these, uh, when I streak them out on plates, you kind of can't see it here. Over here on the left, that little stack of plates that says charismatic microfauna. <laughs> um, these are actually bac bacterial growth plates. So I will swab the surface of the shark or whatever surface I'm looking at, I'll plate them on those petri dishes and they just kind of randomly grow. And then when they grow up for a few days, so every place you swab it, a single bacterial cell um, is laid down on that auger, which is kind of like, it's kind of like um, jello jiggler, <laughs> but it's bacteria food. And um, it grows and divides for a few days until you can visibly see it, that, that um, single cell exponentially grows um, so that you can visually see it. And that's kind of what you're looking at with these dots that are all lined up in a row over here. And then I can subculture them. So what I will do, we actually take sterile toothpicks, toothpicks that we put in a little sterile vial and autoclave so that they're nice and sterile. And we will um, pick single colonies from the original swabbed plates and move them to these plates, like this one in the middle. It looks like it has little dashes on it. And you can see white shark bacteria um, are all different colors. So that's kind of unusual <laughs> what I've been looking at with uh, shark bacteria or anything else that I've looked at in the ocean. So that's kind of cool to me. Um, and then we get them onto these ordered little plates. We kind of put them in 96 well libraries that we can cryopreserve. And to cryopreserve something, you need to put, in this case, we put glycerol in it. That keeps the individual cells from freezing solid. If they freeze solid, they'll form ice crystals and burst open. And that's kind of the principle with cryopreservation is just keeping those cells from forming ice crystals and bursting open so that you can deep freeze them, put them in the minus 80, and then you can pull them out and assay them whenever you want. So we put them in these 96 well plate assay uh, well plates. And then we can pull them out and kind of replica plate them onto these rectangular auger plates. And that's what you're looking at right above the shark there. We let those grow for about uh, anywhere from three to five days. 
And that way the bacteria, which are making these chemicals, the antibiotics, they do this, they make them as a chemical weapon for their own niche, kind of a microbial ecology niche um, to keep other bacteria from uh, using up all of their uh, carbon sources. Um, and so they will literally just um, exude them out of the cell and it, it um, ends up diffusing into the auger around it. And then we can overlay it with pathogenic test strains. And here, if you're looking at the bottom right, um, this plate um, may have been overlaid with MRSA, methicillin-resistant staphylococcus. And if you look right in the middle um, of that plate, you'll see this dark halo around a, kind of a little orange bacterial colony. That is where that bacterial colony produced an antibiotic that killed MRSA. And so you, that's just a zone of no growth. Everywhere else, it looks kind of cloudy. Um, that's where the MRSA grew. So that's kind of how we identify whether or not it's producing an antibiotic. And then we go through um, various different stages to try to decide if it might be a good candidate for drug discovery. So let me make sure I understand this. Dr. Ritchie, so basically you jump onto the platform, you swab the shark with, I've seen them, it's basically like a Q-tip, right? Yeah, that's sterile. And then you take that Q-tip and you rub it on a little Petri dish, right? Yep. And then you put that Petri dish in an environment where the bacteria can grow and multiply. Yeah. And that's yep. how you study it? Did I did I make that too simple? Or? No, that, that's exactly how simple it is. <laughs> it's that simple. We just get it as soon as the important thing is as soon as we get off of the boat, I mean, you want to plate those out immediately because they start to change or they'll die or the ones that grow better under certain conditions will start to swamp it out. So I really want a snapshot of what bacteria are there. So you need to um, swab those uh out immediately so you can get a good representation of what was there in that moment when you swab them. And then they, it takes them anywhere from two days to five days to grow up, depending on the bacteria. And we just grow them, try to grow them in about the same temperature as, uh, you know, room temperature or whatever it is on the boat, or, or it just depends. The water, whatever temperature the water is, it's just kind of ambient temperature and um, let okay. them do their thing. I know a lot of these the students here are, are high school students, and I'm thinking back to high school, and I remember doing an experiment where a teacher had to swab the inside of their our cheek, uh, I think with like a toothpick or something. I don't remember, and then we rubbed it in a we put it in a petri dish, and then we came back and we looked at it a couple days later. Is basically that's that's what you're doing only with white sharks, Is right? That, exactly. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Okay, so let's. Uh, I think. You have some of your findings here on the next slide, is that right? Yeah, I think I put just a couple in, in there. Well, this is just showing, and this is just showing the last, kind of that process in a little more detail. So this is kind of how we take them to start to subculture them off of these plates, off of a charismatic microfauna stack over there. We'll take a single colony and kind of get it get it off by itself on a plate. And that's what you're looking at in the middle there. And then these go into cryopreservation. And then what you're looking at on the far right over here are the assay plates. So we'll actually plate these out on rectangular auger plates. And this is exactly the same thing as the round ones. We just, it's like a marine auger that we use that has nutrients that bacteria, heterotrophic bacteria like. Those are the ones that like a carbon source. Um, and we just plate them out and make replicas so we can plate out, uh, we can test them against like 12 different pathogenic test strains and, and kind of see those, look for the halos like we saw in that last slide. And then the next slide will show a few of the identities. So we have a lot of bacteria that produce antibiotics associated with them. And one thing we also do is genetically identify them. Now to do that, you have to purify the bacteria, isolate the DNA, and then you end up amplifying a gene that you use for um, phylogenetic analysis. In this case, it's called the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And it's just a gene that's universally used to, um, to kind of put them together on a phylogenetic tree. And then you kind of do a blast search with those sequences. So you've, you'll get them back from the sequencing facility and it'll look like 
a Word file with a bunch of A's, G's, C's, and T's, and you literally copy and paste that into a, a free program that's on the internet, and press blast, and it searches, and it, <laughs> it will tell you the identity of your bacterium, or it'll tell you the closest relative. And so what you're looking at here are some of the bacteria that produce antibiotics that I isolated from the teeth over here on the left and their identities based on that DNA sequencing. So you can see Psychrobacter, Halomonas species. A lot of these are, these are all marine species. Vibrio species, Vibrio is really common in marine waters. Um, she can say, um, these are just the bacteria that you can culture. And that's actually a small percentage of all of the bacteria that are there. So we also have collaborators at Georgia Tech that are looking at a more comprehensive picture of all the bacteria that are there. Um, but we're just looking at the ones that we can culture and that produce antibiotics. And this is looking at, uh, and I didn't put all of the body regions up here, but this is uh, looking at the ampullae of Lorenzini. That's one of the sensory, um, sensory organs on the front of the shark that's really sensitive to electrical signals. And we find a lot of antibiotic producing bacteria associated with that kind of the gel that's inside of that. And this is just showing kind of a snapshot of those bacteria. So I'm, I'm curious, Kim, I'm looking at these and I see all these different colors. So you, you swab the teeth and then all of the different colors on that graph on the left, those represent different bacteria that you actually found on the teeth. Right. And it's kind of a relative proportion of the number of, of them that we showed were present. It, just out of curiosity, is that surprising? So you only swipe or you only swab one small little spot and you got all those different it kind of is surprising because these are just the bacteria that you can culture and uh, we we can culture over well over 25 or 30 genera of bacteria so it's kind of amazing <laughs> and in general have you found when you swab the teeth versus swabbing the dorsal or the cloaca or anything are you actually seeing a difference in the bacteria that you get off of the teeth versus the dorsal or the cloaca or anywhere else, do you actually see differences? I have to look at it a little more carefully. I, I do see some differences, but you see a lot of overlap as well. Um, and I need to look at them more carefully. So far, we've only looked at two white sharks. So um, we have a lot more in the freezer from Nova Scotia that we can start comparing and seeing if there really is a trend between teeth or different body regions. Um, it's a little hard to tell with, these, with just these two. We do seem to find um, a lot of diversity on the dorsal surface as well, just the epidermal surface. Um, and a little less diversity in certain other regions. So this is looking at claspers and an injury site where you might see, um, and it's kind of interesting because what you see in these injuries are bacteria that are opportunistic, that are already known opportunistic pathogens like Vibrio species. Vibrio is ordinarily associated with um, organisms, but you'll see the number really rise when, when it's uh, diseased or injured. And that's kind of what you see here. This, the Vibrio is kind of making up the majority of the bacteria that we culture from injury. So that's interesting. And, and eh, but kind of what I would have expected. One of the questions I just got here, Dr. Ritchie, is some of the colors on the, on the pie chart are the same. So how do you know which bacteria is which? Is it? Yeah. Okay. It, well, yeah. Is just look, just at the, a, look at the one for injury. So Vibrio here is blue, and that shows you that Vibrio is represented in this blue region only on the injury. Uh, on the claspers, there's a different one that's that color, but you can, you can kind so of. It's really just a, this is just a simplified version for this, this presentation. Is right. When you look at it, like in your lab, you have more complex ways of yeah. showing all of these different bacteria and all these different colors. Okay. Yeah. Great. That uh, was just one question that I had. Okay. And I don't know if I had another slide on there. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Kim. And then with this, talking about this, like, creation of a superbug or antibiotic resistant, if you want to jump in and say anything, let me know. Okay. Um, this is um, an image of a gigantic petri dish, essentially. It was a, a study done by Harvard, and it's actually a YouTube video associated with it. If you just go to YouTube and look up, you know, antibiotic resistant um, P. 
petri dish, Harvard, or some kind of search like that, you'll see it. But you can see all these different pathways on it. So all the way on the outsides of this giant dish were um, bacteria that were placed on it. And then you can kind of see these natural columns uh, within the giant petri dish. So uh, the second one in from the outside, um, that was a low dose of antibiotics. And the further you go in towards the middle, the concentration of antibiotic increases. So you can see where you have these antibiotic or these bacteria over time slowly develop to where they are able to withstand a very high dose of that antibiotic. Um, so again, go ahead and check this video out if you would like some more um, really cool visuals on how this whole process happens. Um, and then in the center there, you can see like that's a very high dose of antibiotics and the bugs are just not being able to be killed by it. Um, and then on the next slide, we have created an activity that you can do at home to kind of demonstrate this whole process. So what I did was I typed this all up so that you could just take a picture of the screen if this is something you would like to do, um, just so that it's easier and everybody can have it ready to go. So this is an antibiotic resistance lab that I actually do with uh, my biology students. Um, so to modify it for home and to make it a little bit easier for you to do, you're just going to get items that can have three different colors. They don't even have to be the same items. So if you don't have things that are different colors, but you have different items, that's fine. You just need three uh, different specific things. So some things that I thought of that you might just have at home, um, you know, Easter's coming up. So if you get some candy for Easter, you can use that. Uh, Legos are always a good one because those are so many different colors. You can even use dried beans if you have those available on the house. So you don't have to leave the house in order to do this. So you do need specific numbers for each of these. So you need 20 of color one, uh, 15 of colors two and three. You also need a bowl, which is going to represent your host, um, and then dice. So if you don't have dice, there's actually quite a few apps that you can use, or you can use them online. If you just Google um, virtual dice, you're able to pull those up. You only need one also. So you can go kind of go into your board games and pull one out and be able to do it that way. So for your procedures, you're going to add 13 of color one, six of color two, and only one of color three to your host to infect it with the pathogenic bacteria. So the whole scenario is that you've been given an antibiotic by your doctor. However, we're a little absent-minded here during our quarantine, um, and sometimes you forget to take it. So the dice is going to be used to determine whether or not you remember to take your antibiotics. So when you roll the dice, if you get a one, three, five, or a six, you remember to take it. If you roll a two or a four, you forgot to take it that time. So with each roll of a one, three, five, or six, five bacteria will die. Now it's scaled to where you're, take, you're killing the most impacted bacteria first, which is going to be color one. Once color one's all gone, so you're gonna remove five of them. You saw we put 13 in at the beginning, so this is gonna take a couple of rounds. Antibiotics don't work overnight. Um, so once they're all gone, then you can start removing color two, and eventually you can start removing color three. Now remember, bacteria does reproduce, so after each roll, your remaining bacteria is going to go through that process. So you're going to add another item for each color left in the bowl. Um, so if you have two remaining of color one, you're going to add two more of those bacteria. And then you're going to do this until all of your bacteria are gone. So eventually you will start to um, do some work on those antibiotic resistance bacteria, which are going to be um, color three at the end of the day. But you'll see that this process takes a much longer time than it does to knock out the bacteria that's impacted by these medications. So that's just a little fun activity that you can do while you're home. Um, it can take some time to get through it, depending on how many times you forget to take your antibiotics. So go ahead and, and check it out and let us know how it goes. So with that, um, that's the last slide that we have right now for this one. So if you have any questions. Yeah, I do have some questions here. Um, one of the questions that was asked early on and then a couple of times throughout um, and either Jen or Dr. Rich, you can answer this. Are sharks the only um, sea creatures or sea animals that have this bacteria on them? No, um, I spent years studying corals and found that corals have bacteria on them that produce antibiotics. And these bacteria tend to go away when the temperatures increase and it correlates with coral bleaching and when corals are get more infections. So it kind of looks like um, they need those 
beneficial bacteria to help keep healthy and they kind of get out swamped when it gets a little warmer. And, and people are finding that with all other types of organisms, particularly um, some of the ancient ones, a lot of the invertebrates and you now sharks and rays. It's a good question. Another question that I have here, um, we've heard a couple of times that, you know, sharks can't get sick or that sharks heal very quickly. Um, so what the question was, do, does this bacteria infect a shark's wound? Um, and then I would, I guess my addition to that question is, does it, does that bacteria actually help or what, why do sharks heal so quickly? How does this bacteria help that process? I think you're on mute, Dr. Ritchie. Sorry. <laughs> First of all, it's, 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 it's highly anecdotal uh, about the wound healing. I mean, a lot of people have made these observations, but there haven't been a lot of careful science studies showing that they actually heal their wounds quicker. It's a lot of observations though that they seem to and that they don't keep injuries for long. Um, but second, um, some of the beneficial, what the question was whether or not some of the beneficial or the antibiotic producing bacteria could the infect The question them. was if, if these sharks are covered in bacteria, does that get in a wound and say infect them? Yeah, I mean, one thing that we see is that those Vibrio type of bacteria, which, by the way, aren't producing a lot of antibiotics, but they can be opportunistic. Those are the ones that are present on the surface of healthy um, epidermal layers in sharks, um, but they're present in much greater abundance in the injury. So these same bacteria that can be on the skin can get in and probably um, cause some infection as well. Um, another question here, um, in, in all of the swabs that you ever, ever taken, um, off sharks, have you ever come across any new bacteria or anything that hasn't necessarily been seen before? Yeah, I, I, I didn't put some of these slides in, but there are several bacteria, uh, one in particular that was only like 85% identical to anything in the world's wide database. So that suggests it could be a new genus. Uh, but definitely a new species. We'll be triple checking that. <laughs> so the answer is maybe. I think yes. Oh, very cool. That's <laughs> awesome. Coming. That I actually I I didn't know that um, until this week. That's super cool. One thing that I think a lot of people get hung up on with O search is they see that it's you know they get fascinated by the tagging and the being able to follow sharks and all of that. But really there's so much more happening on the ship than just putting a spot tag on that animal and watching where it goes, where clearly you could potentially discover something brand new or we're, you know, right. We're supporting 18 studies, including, you know, one of yours. And so going well beyond the tags, I mean, that's really cool. Um, another question that some people have asked are, um, you know, this, the shark bacteria, they're carrying this bacteria around with them. Is it affecting ecosystems where they go? Is it infecting ecosystems? Affect, I think I said affecting, but infecting okay. could also. Oh, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about it. I, I tend to think of it more in a different perspective and that wherever the sharks go, the environmental microbes are affecting their microbes. Like we tend to find um, kind of an overlap of different types of bacteria depending on the uh, environment that they're collected from. Like maybe Nova Scotia seawater bacteria are going to be a little bit different than the ones that are from warmer water, and that's going to affect the microbial community on the shark. But I haven't really given a lot of thought to the bacteria on the sharks affecting other ecosystems, I mean, or other areas or organisms. So there's, one question. there's two questions here that I'll sort of take care of in one. Did we put the sharks in captivity after we swab them? No, the sharks are released um, immediately. They're on the platform for no longer than 15 minutes before we let them go. And in that time, that's, you know, our cutoff at 15 minutes, we let the shark go. Um, but then there was another question here that a couple of people asked, have you ever taken um, bacteria samples off of a shark in captivity? versus a shark in the wild, and do you see differences? 
That's a good question. I did a study looking at stingrays in captivity versus in the wild. And one thing you see in captivity um, is that you get a lot less diversity. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. When in Aquaria, they sometimes ozonate the water to try to knock back some of the uh, bacteria that are coming in, especially if you're bringing in seawater from the environment. Um, so it's kind of more sterile water. Um, so what you might find is that those bacteria that you do find on the surface of the stingray in this case are, are more the bacteria that are supposed to be there, the true mutualists, because you're not getting all of that environmental influence. But that's a really good question. You do get, you do get kind of a bottleneck effect when you look at animals in captivity because you get a bottleneck effect when you have things in enclosed spaces. So great question. And then another question here that's been asked a couple of times, um, does the food that sharks eat affect the bacteria that they may have with them or on them? I don't know the answer to that. We have people that are looking at um, nutrition in sharks, but you are what you eat. So what you, <laughs> what you eat tends to change your physiology and your physiology is what selects the type of bacteria. So I would, I would think it would affect it. Another thing that I noticed is um, sharks that are swimming in their food source. I, I noticed when we looked at young of the year, the year old sharks, that they're, they're fishing in Menhaden and these big schools in Menhaden. And I got the craziest type of bacteria off of those. I couldn't even assay any of them, these really fast growing bacteria. And I, I'm con I have no way of knowing, but I'm convinced it had to do with the fact that they're swimming around in their food source and that food source affected the microbial community that I ended up being on the shark. So in several different ways, I think that's true. And so that, that actually is a good segue into another question that somebody asked and somebody asked yesterday too, which was, I, um, when you swab sharks in different regions, different places, do you find that you're collecting samples of different kinds of bacteria? Well, we've only done the comprehensive look on two white sharks, so we need to get more numbers, and we have more numbers in the freezer. We have 11 more <laughs> sharks <laughs> waiting to be assayed, so we'll be able to answer that question a little bit better. But just based on the two sharks, we, we have some overlap between regions, and we definitely have some some bacteria that are different in different regions, so. And then there was a question um, I was asked a little earlier on. Um, well, as we start wrapping things up here, we'll bring your research back to potentially um, being able to develop new medicines. Can you just, as, as easily as possible, um, summarize how you go from doing your work and taking swabs of sharks to how that uh, could help help produce new antibiotics, like in, you know. Okay, so what we can do is, I come up with good candidates. So what I have are bacteria, I have over 50 probably that are good candidates and they will either only kill MRSA or only kill vancomycin resistant enterococcus, or I'll have some that'll kill everything. So those are broad spectrum, potentially broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, so, the next step is to get a partner <laughs> that's a chemist, so like a biotech company to partner with. And what they have to do is be able to scale up so that they can isolate enough of this to prove that it's a novel compound. So the first thing you have to do is prove it's a novel compound. Um, the steps that I take are to show what it's active against and to show whether or not it's a small peptide or another type of compound antibiotic. And I also do assays to see if they lice red blood cells. So that would let you know if it's going to be a terrible drug for humans. If they lice red blood cells, you probably don't want to swallow those pills. So, so from there, we really need to rely on chemists that can then go in and, and make sure that the structure is novel and then safe. Then you go into clinical trials. Well, one thing that I found super cool um, uh, in some of your work is that you can look at, at the bacteria found on, say, the teeth of a, a white shark, look what bacteria is found there, and then identify how you could potentially treat somebody who gets infected after some kind of an interaction. Is that, that 
Is that true? By just by understanding what's in the shark's mouth, you can then start figuring out a treatment. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly right. So we're not only looking at what antibiotics the shark bacteria produce, but I had a high school student who wanted to do work on looking at what antibiotics that we currently have on the market will kill the bacteria that are in the shark's teeth. So he wanted to do that to see if, um, to see which antibiotics would be the best to advise doctors to use. And his papers, his work will be published and it can actually be used for medical purposes. Um, so part of a problem is that if you get bitten by a shark, you're often not killed, but you end up with a nasty secondary infection. A lot of those bacteria can become opportunistic and cause infections. So he wanted to see which antibiotic killed them. So that's another good application of this research. So two, two final questions here um, before we wrap things up, because we're coming up to our time window here. Um, first, we, it's obviously on everybody's mind. So I guess if you could give a quick answer, you know, shark bacteria, could it potentially be uh, something that could help with, say, what's going on with the coronavirus today? It's, you don't have to go into too much detail, but. Right. If you, um, we have all of these bacteria cryopreserves. So anything, if you can come up with a bioassay for it, if somebody has a bioassay for um, inactivating coronavirus, I don't know. It's not my area. Um, it could be screened for that. And yeah, there's absolutely. Marine bacteria are a completely untapped source of, of compounds that could be used for all kinds of medicines, not just antibiotics. So it could be screened for any activity of interest and there's a potential that it could have antiviral activity in some form. Okay, and the last question, there's a number of, a couple of people who have asked this, um, probably seeming to enjoy what you do and potentially wanting to do that themselves someday when they grow up, what, uh, what degree or what, if you had just like a quick bit of advice on what somebody can do to sort of end up with a job kind of like yours? Okay. My advice would be not to get a degree in marine biology because everybody wants a degree in marine biology. You need to get a degree. My PhD was in genetics. Uh, you can get a PhD in bioinformatics or in chemistry and then apply it. You can always go work with a marine biologist and become a marine biologist after the fact. Um, but you'll have a niche. You'll have a better niche for yourself if you go ahead and really um, try to find something that you can do that a lot of marine biologists don't know how to do. And you can feel free to email me if you have. I love to help students with things like that. So. <laughs> you can find me under the USC University of South Carolina Buford webpage, and you can find my email address. Something to add to that really quickly as a high school student, actually a middle school student as well, you can start entering into science research in those grades. So get into a program, start doing science research, start learning about, you know, bacteria and some of the cool things that she's been talking about and applying it in science fair projects and, and getting to know people that way is the way that you can get started right now. So even if you're a freshman in high school, you can start working towards some cool stuff like Kim's doing um, by doing science research at your your level that you're at right now. So you can start networking and getting involved. Like Kim was saying, she did have a high school student that she worked with and she mentored. So that is an avenue you can definitely tap into today. Like you can start looking up science for projects for next year. And since that is the last question, we, we are going um, to be continuing to do more of these lessons as we all work from home and learn from home and et cetera. Um, Jennifer, do you want to really recap what kind of resources there are on OSEARCH.org that people can, can take advantage of right now? Sure. So right now we have over 100 free lesson plans that are posted that are available to download uh, for free, like I said. So you can go to the osearch.org website, click on educate, uh, programs and then education and you'll see all of our curriculum available. We have edu um, expedition packets on there. We actually have a really great packet for Earth Day, which is April 22nd. So if you wanna do a whole week long activity at home, you can go ahead and download that packet and start looking at it and prepping for your Earth, Earth Week that we have coming up. Uh, we also have STEM camps available when we are on expedition. So if we're in your local area, we have free camps that you can attend. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, and then we will be doing these for the next few weeks. Um, 
want to say where we planned out at least eight weeks. So you can join us every single week, uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays for um, talks just like this one so that you can learn and do some activities with us. And you can also email us at education.osearch.org if you ever have any questions for us and for how to get involved or for an idea for an activity. Yeah, no, I was going to add that. If you guys, if anybody out there has any questions, uh, osearch, or excuse me, education at osearch.org, email us there uh, if you have any questions. Uh, Dr. Richie, Jen, thank you guys so much for the awesome lesson today. Um, and I think with, unless you guys have any final words, I think we'll, we'll sign off. Thank See you, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.